Welcome to this last session of today's conference uh, with the theme Media at the Frontline. My name is Henrik Sundbom and I will be the moderator of this last session. Uh, and I'm actually going to start by quoting an ad for one of my favorite TV shows, Watching the Hawks, on the Russian propaganda outlet RT America. Uh, for those of you who don't follow this show, the name speaks for itself. Um, a beautiful and quite dramatic ad for watching the Hawks has been running for about two and a half years in RT America. Black and white footage shows two men and a wo woman entering a graveyard and a fema female speaker reads a poem. About your sudden passing, I've only just learned. You wore yourself thin, taking your last wrong turn. Your act caught up to you as we all knew it would. I'd tell you I'm sorry, if only I could. So I write these last words in hopes to put to rest, these things that I never got off my chest. I remember when we first met, my life turned on each breath. But then my feelings started to change. You talked about war like, it, like if it was a game. Still some were fond of you, those that didn't like to question or argue. And I secretly promised to never be like you. It's said one doesn't leave a funeral the same as one enters. The mind gets consumed with death, but this one quite differs. I speak to you now because there were no other takers to proclaim that mainstream media has met its maker. And then the camera zooms in on a tombstone. Mainstream media died in 2015. This short sequence tells us two things about Russia's relation to Western mainstream media. First, many people still argue whether mainstream media is under attack or not. <coughs> RT declared it dead two and a half years ago. Second, when RT started, its image was quite similar to Western public service broadcasting, but with a Russian twist. That ambition is gone. RT excludes itself from the term mainstream media. It does not only quote and cooperate with so-called alternative media outlets, it identifies itself as alternative media. We have heard today that influence operations is nothing new, but this unholy alliance is a new reality that we and you have to face each day. The title of this session is Media at the Front Line. Uh, and I'm joined by Eva Burman from Eskilstuna Kriden, Patrick Oxanen from Mitt Media, and Anders Lindberg from Aftonbladet. Media at the Front Line is a title with double meanings. On one hand, media is under constant attack. As we have learned from Jessica Aro earlier today, and we'll hear from Eva in a moment, Journalists and media outlets that report about information warfare, or, or whatever we should call it, trolls and such phenomena face harassment and sometimes direct threats. On the other hand, traditional media outlets struggle to find a path forward in the new and rapidly changing media landscape. Serious journalists have to compete with less serious newcomers who compete with speed, scandals and unscrupulous texts that do their best to imitate or mock serious journalism, sometimes with connections uh, to or even money from political groups on the extremes or even foreign powers. But Media to Frontline is not only about being under attack. Media can, of course, also provide a lot, maybe all of the answers. Our journalists are one of the best resources that we have to create long-term resilience, to influence operations. And I'm really looking forward to hear your answers from the media perspective today, because that is, not, that is something that we haven't really heard about so far. We have heard a lot about the threats, but no one from media have, re have really given the answers what we can do uh, to tackle these challenges. Um, and first, uh, Patrick. Uh, and uh, I will not give you the answers uh, right in the beginning. I want to to start to, to make some remarks about the challenges that we see and that we have 
right now. Uh, and uh, of course, a lot of what I have said had been addressed um, splendidly by the earlier uh, panels, but uh, I would like to point out speed is a very different thing today compared with the Cold War. Back in those days, uh, for example, when uh, that guy was Prime Minister of Sweden, Torbjörn Feldin, the papers came out once a day. Now every local newspaper have 24-7 publishing. That is an enormous speed. In the 80s, you could sit down, discuss what would come in next day's paper. Today, publishing is almost autonomous uh, from the publisher in that business industry of news. We've seen disruptive business model coming up with Google and Facebook, cutting the finance for media. We have the internet logic, and everyone can publish, and it's really cheap to publish uh, alternative news and fake stories. If you compare it with the Cold War, or if you would like to address a mass audience in a country, uh, you would have put in enormous resources in building up a newspaper distribution, printing and so on. But today, a web page which looks decent enough to compare with news media sites is really, really cheap. And another factor, we have fewer reporters with knowledge in complicated matters. Here the Swedish Defense Department have some figures that I think it's really interesting in this context. In the 90s, we had around 30 journalists in Sweden that were, one could say, pretty good at defense and security. Today, that number goes down to five to seven. And then you also include editorial writers like myself. So it's even fewer people in the newsroom that can handle these complicated issues. And what that could lead to, uh, I would like to give you some couple of examples for the discussion. First example is in May 2015 when Commercial TV4 went to Moscow to interview Viktor Kremenyuk at the US Canada Institute of the Russian Science Academy. Uh, he was presented as a think tanker close to Kremlin. What they didn't say, it was founded by KGB during the days of Andropov when he was head of KGB. So it was the FSB think, think tank. And what he said during this interview was, why don't we make Gotland neutral again, like it was in the 20s? And here in this distinguished and knowledgeable audience, I assume that you are pretty well aware of that that status never existed in the 20s for the island of Gotland. The purpose of putting that phrasing into that interview is to make the audience start to think about Gotland like Åland, which had a neutral demilitarized status that dates back to the end of Crimean War in the 1850s. The reporter didn't react during the interview, didn't do any follow-up questions, uh, and so on. The newsroom didn't react on this, so it was broadcasted to the Swedish audience. And then, uh, half a year later, debate articles started to appear in the Swedish infosphere. Could Gotland be like Åland? Make Gotland to an island of peace? And in Almedalen 2016, an event was held that different organizations discussed the possibility to make Gotland an Åland. And what of the Åland experience could we bring to Gotland? to demilitarize the island, kick out Swedish military from the island, and make Baltic Sea to great peace sea. And in the beginning of last year, it was official party politics for the feminist party they, that they adopted this policy that they want to demilitarize Scotland. And then we have this view into mainstream Swedish politics as a total legitimate view that you could have, that other parties and journalists need to deal with in the public debate. My next example that I'm going to tell you is stolen from Anders Lindberg, and he was talking about that in Folk of Försvar, Sälen, a couple of years ago, and it's from Dagens Nyheter. Here you have the example of 
what happens when you do rewrites on rewrites. This story, anonymous eyewitness states, Ukrainian Air Force uh, shot down MH17 was picked up from Daily Mail. And if you remember Peter Pomerantsev from the stage here, you can imagine what kind of publication Daily Mail is. But they didn't make this story up on themselves. They took it from Komsomolskaya Pravda, which had an anonymous eyewitness that appeared, stating that he had seen this on a Ukrainian Air Force base. This is the problem with lack of knowledge and the problem with speed in today's journalism. And here comes the third problem, and that is that Dagens Nyheter's piece from uh, 2014 about anonymous eyewitness is still published without any commentary, without any note that this is fake news, Russian disinformation. So it's still out there on the big World Wide Web and could start to appear again in Facebook groups, in arguments, and people want to push this narrative, could bring up Dagens Nyheter, which is a highly trustworthy Swedish newspaper into the debate. Another example of the problem that you have with knowledge is uh, last summer, the island of Gotland was visited by Ambassador Viktor Tatarintsev of the Russian Embassy, interviewed by Fredrik Karim uh, in a live interview, where he suddenly stated, what the hell did Swedish FRA planes do at our borders? And I just want to show you this example because it shows you how complex it is to deal with these issues and find yourself in a live TV situation when you interview someone like Ambassador Tatarinsev when he starts to push some narratives. It needs a lot of knowledge to be able to handle this situation in a really good way. And some trends then for the future. Well, our debate has already been pushed. It will continue. As been stated before, we will see more sophisticated disinformation. Of course, with artificial intelligence into video, audio, it opens up a totally new field of uh, what you could do. Other type of influence will be combined with disinformation. And the more knowledge we gain about disinformation, I think we will see more influence on economical sector or using criminal networks, etc., etc. And we will see more attacks, either direct from Russia or indirect, inspired by hate speech, target journalists and opinion makers. And when I was sitting here listening at the panels before, uh, I saw that my Facebook friend, the Norwegian author John Forset, wrote on his Facebook that, hey, look at my Wikipedia in Norway. Someone has here edited and put in that I'm a convicted criminal uh, in a sexual case, a pedophile case. Uh, so it is ongoing, meanwhile we're speaking here. It's happening 24-7 and it will continue to go on. So this is the main target for our discussion, but uh, with these words I leave the floor now to Eva Burman. Mm-hmm. That happens itself. So, Eva, uh, my name is Eva Burman. I am editor of chief at the local newspaper in Eskilstuna. And I am going to talk about an influence operation that has been working against us, against us for several, several years. Uh, Eskilstuna Kuriren is a liberal newspaper in, in Sörmland, and uh, there are 45 journalists at the, the editorial plan. Uh, we are very known for award-winning investigative journalist, uh, journalism uh, for years, uh, and the reporter Mattias Ståle, who is we, we're going to talk about, is an expert on extremist uh, movements. Uh, under 2015, uh, the phone started to ring uh, to the, uh, the editorial staff. It was uh, always a private person, uh, the, the read question from, uh, from a script. Uh, the, the main uh, object of this conversation was all, always uh, very racist. Uh, they wanted to have our views and 
classical uh, right-wing Islam Islamophobic, anti-feminist and anti-Semitic and pro-Russian pro uh, agendas. Uh, and uh, those clips, uh, recordings, what's, was then, uh, then uh, uh, published on YouTube uh, under the uh, name Granskning Sverige. Uh, Granskning Sverige is a, a right-wing uh, organization uh, that uh, used to influence opinions, uh, harass and threaten politicians, journalists, government officials, and often leads to new threats in social media. Uh, in 2016, the influence operation escalated towards uh, Eskilstuna Krida. The number of calls was increasing. We talk about hundreds of them uh, to every, pa uh, every uh, editorial staff, uh, but typically at me, my uh, colleague Matthias Ståle, and the uh, uh, debate uh, politi politician uh, staff, who is called Alex Voronov. Other operation at, uh, under 2016 uh, was uh, in May. Uh, we were uh, 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 publishing a fake uh, debate article with the aim to reduce confidence in us. It was uh, um, an environmental politician who is uh, writing about uh, making uh, uh, areas uh, like uh, free for jihadism and stuff like that. And uh, it was uh, not her who had wrote it. It was definitely a right-wing person who has planted it at us. Uh, and we uh, unfortunately published it because we had, for the, un, at, under this uh, period, uh, persons who wasn't confident in uh, editing this kind of uh, material. So we did wrong, uh, definitely. And in June, we had a spam attack against our politician editor. Uh, his email was corrupted. Uh, experts said it was uh, ordered it in a dark web. Uh, his uh, mail was uh, definitely out of use. Uh, of course, that's not dangerous in any way, but it's a uh, finger pointing at us. Uh, and he's an expert in Russia. He's from Russia and is very well known and also uh, often a, a person that uh, journalists speak to when they want to know things about Russia and uh, Ukraine and stuff like that. And then in May, uh, RIS uh, is uh, putting this survey on the, the web. Uh, I have the, the link down there, you can see, if you want to look at it yourself. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, maybe know what this is. Uh, it's uh, like the uh, PR branch for uh, SVR, isn't it? Yes, Patrick can tell us about this mm -hmm. later maybe. And uh, they rank in media how aggressive they are against Russia and Putin. And they put an index on each media they are uh, looking to. And in this survey, they have 45 countries. And you see it's the red countries, mostly in this report, and also the yellow ones. The color uh, tells us how, how aggressive the countries are. And uh, this is the, the United States. Uh, you can see it, it's between 2014 and 2015. You see the index at the right. You see the, the media's name there. And you can see that the index has decreased from 2014 to 2015. Then you have uh, Great Britain, their, their uh, media's the same there, except a few maybe. No, everybody's decreased. You can see the average is 2.2 index, aggressive index. And then you have the French medias, the same trend there, is declining. Uh, we have the German, 
medias. You can see the same trend there from quite high figures, 2014 to 2015. And then we have Sweden. And I just mentioned that Eskilstuna Kyriden is a small local newspaper in Sweden. If you see the index, 2014 it's 14 and 2015 it's 22. It's the highest index in the whole report. There's no other who is even near it. It's a Polish paper who has 21.75. They don't uh, explain how they put this index. You can't understand it. If you to look at it, you can find pieces of articles. Uh, that is, they have taken e each uh, real, real text from, from us. Uh, so, uh, we are worst in the world. I can't really understand it, but I think it might be because of uh, Alex Voronov, who is an expert in Russia and wrote very much about Krim and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, the fall of 2016, we uh, decided to, to infiltrate the Swedish troll factory Granskring Sverige. Uh, that was after a period of uh, massive phone calls, harassments towards us. And we wanted to know what kind of organization who was behind this. And uh, our reporter, Matthias Ståhle, took a job at the Troll Factory, actually. <coughs> uh, Gränsning Sverige, is, uh, is called, uh, is an uh, uh, own website. Uh, they have a YouTube channel, channel. they have a, a homepage, they have a page on uh, Facebook. And uh, we uh, just uh, searched for Grants in Sverige to, to learn who is behind it and found this campaign. Uh, it says that you can earn money if you uh, record someone and get more than 3,000 views on YouTube. Uh, and uh, if you click uh, on the other pages here, they, t they learn how you can hide your IP address and be anonymous and such like this, that. We talked about this and we gave Matthias Ståhle the job to try to get inside the troll factory. And uh, he uh, used a troll account specially made for this. He didn't do anything illegal. He didn't uh, participate in any kind of hate speech, but he liked and uh, de delade. Cheer. Shared, yes, I mean, English, so that uh, shared uh, uh, other links from other persons. And he got a job. Uh, he was told to call uh, a colleague to Patrick uh, at uh, Gotlands Allehanda and try to record him. And in, in uh, meaning that he had did that, he was let in to the troll factory, Gransning Sverige. And this is how it looks inside Gransning Sveriges uh, uh, editorial room. You can, uh, it's very much similar to an editorial room. Uh, uh, you, can, um, uh, you can get assignments here. Uh, you can see what it says, or maybe you can. Uh, but it's uh, very Islamophobic, it's very anti-feminist, it's very anti-Semitic and pro-Russian and of course racist agenda. Um, uh, what's very typical also is uh, you can see several channels in the top. Uh, there are about five or six more when we, uh, we were uh, investigating them. Now they're even more than the double. It's uh, in meaning to, to sh look at that there might be more people there and, than it is. And so uh, that's how we did it. And if you want to read about it, even in English, you can read it and find, the, find it on our website. We had wrote, wrote very much about this kind of operations. Uh, after we published, in 12 hours, there was a, a DDoS attack. They, didn't, uh, they weren't su successful. We have numerous of threats, anonymous, of course, on mail, phone, and in social media. 
We have even had visits home, especially Matthias Dole has been uh, harassed at home. Uh, and hundreds of new phone calls, of course. And they still harass us, as last week we were talking on uh, folk and culture. They tried to call us as crazy. But most love and support, of course. What changed for the better? Uh, I think more people know now what Troll Factory is. Uh, and they get better prepared. I uh, talked about this before colleagues, and now they understand what it's about. Uh, and uh, I think also that they, their ability to reach out to other groups than or not all ready, ready uh, 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 likers, uh, it's much less. Uh, and I think that knowledge vaccinates the people. Absolutely. So, 10 minutes. Um, should I put this down or? No. Nee. Okay, I'm not from Eskilstuna Kreden. Uh, my name is Anders Lindberg from Aftonbladet, uh, which is an independent social democratic uh, web um, editorial page. Uh, and uh, I don't have a presentation, um, but I have a few of the few remarks. Um, the first is if you go back to the start that we heard, you could say that the rumor of mainstream, the death of mainstream media is a little bit premature. Uh, it's still mainstream media that most people in Sweden get their news from. There is this hype about Facebook and Twitter, and of course many people start their day in Facebook, uh, but it's at the end of the day, it's still the big newspapers, it's still the broadcast media that people rely to. And we can very clearly see that this annoys the antagonists. Um, and we can see that we are very much in a kind of global conflict between liberal democracy on one side and authoritarian nationalism on the other. And that authoritarian nationalism is not only Russian, it's also Polish, it's also Hungarian, and it's also Swedish. Uh, it's a kind of global alt-right uh, nationalist movement that sort of borrows from each other, uh, where information flows, methods flows, and you actually learn. Uh, these kind of forces or actors learn from previous experience. And uh, we can see very clearly that when we go into elections this autumn, uh, what happened in the US, what happened in France, what happened in, in Germany will happen in some form here. And it's already have happened. So, so we must have this, this knowledge that we are part of this kind of global conflict. I have a few reflections on, on the situation uh, in Sweden first. I would say that we are still in a learning phase. You can easily get the impression from a distinguished audience like this and the debate that we have, that we have sort of learned this, that we have the methods and structures built up to deal with this situation. The fact is that we don't have this. Um, when, when I go out, for example, I'm quite a lot out talking to trade unionists, uh, the issues of that there is Russian disinformation behind these, these things is news. And it's still news, 2018. So just because the kind of establishment has realized that this is something that happened, it doesn't mean that the Swedish public have realized that. And if you can see that, yes, it's not that we'll go in the trap of Ukraine again. We won't have serious TV debates if, okay, is there Russian uh, little green men or are they not Russian? That debate is history. But if you look at what happened last year when Russia went into Syria, the newspapers were filled with articles about the wonderful Putin plan to, dis, to, to defeat IS. Uh, there were uh, these reports from the Putin great war factory where he was sitting with all these TV screens in Moscow uh, dealing with IS and now he will fight IS and he will defeat IS, which the West doesn't, doesn't uh, accomplish. Of course this was a lie. He didn't defeat IS. He wanted to push up Bashar al-Assad. But all the Swedish newspapers, even if we learn from Ukraine, were full of this last year, uh, including uh, the one that I work for. So, so I think that we are in a learning phase. And the problem with the Russian strategy is that they develop new strategies all the time. It means that 
when they have this thing that have happened in, in hacking or, or information warfare, it will look something different this autumn. Uh, and I just hope that we are sort of catching up uh, and that we're not that naive. I think that RT, the way RT were dealing with, for example, Brexit or the uh, US campaign wouldn't work here. RT doesn't have that kind of reach. But those who have is the far right uh, web media. And I think that we shouldn't underestimate the possibility of completely fake news in the far right web media. We've already seen a couple of two years ago in one of the medias who were saying that in, in an asylum home there was an arms cache that was found. It was a complete in, in fake story. Uh, it didn't really work because Swedish media actually checked their sources, so they checked if this had happened or not. But this is something that probably will happen. Another th thing that probably will happen is the combination of street activists and media. We saw that, for example, in, in, uh, in uh, Gothenburg when the Nazis were demonstrating. If you look at the right-wing media landscape around that, it's, it's an enormous apparatus that reaches a lot of people. And in a Facebook flow, you don't see the difference between Nordfront or Samhällsnytt or Dagens Nyheter or Ekot. They all look the same in the Facebook flow. And when this happens four days before the elections, we need to be prepared on a completely different level than we are. So we are in a learning, and we have to be a realist in that. And I think that also we have to be realist in who is sort of on our side in this. Because the old traditional Swedish total war cons or total defense concept actually includes uh, the civic organizations. It includes the trade unions, the employer organizations. Uh, all the different kind of organizations that are this traditional Swedish uh, society, the pil pillars of society. And we need to get into a situation where all these pillars are involved, when the information is spread to all these parts of society. Uh, and I would argue that this has not happened yet. And even if there will, will be a new uh, authority dealing with psychological warfare, that's something that will happen after the elections. And this is something that happens now. We have proposed elf army, uh, we jokingly say that, that you have a troll army, you should defend yourself with elves. But the kind of knowledge of digital self-defense, like the Swedish defense bloggers, for example, who are a, a perfect digital self-defense structure, uh, that ordinary people learn how to deal with these issues. Uh, that is the key. If they are a centralized, top-to-bottom structure who attacks the open society, the open society should defend itself by a decentralized, uh, structure that where everyone knows that when this happens, people react. When these kind of narratives that Patrick was talking about earlier, of course there should be a reaction on the net that this is not the truth. And then it will not have that, that kind of effect. And I still lack that elf army. I would like to see that. Um, the other thing, I think, as a reflection, is that the authorities and media is not, going, is not understanding each other at this point. The authorities are saying that it's more and more important with correct information all over the country. It's more and more important with uh, critical journalism. But in the media, we are in a crisis. Local media outlets in Sweden is going down. And they're going down on the level that they will disappear in a few years if we don't do anything. And the, that vacuum will be filled by independent bloggers, politically motivated, that don't know journalism, that run political agendas. And if something happens from the outside, from Russian disinformation, they will not know how to deal with this. And when, I, when you listen to the debate about how the state should support local media, for example, it's far behind the debate when we discuss psychological warfare. And the fact is, without journalism on the ground all over Sweden, there will be no psychological defense. And that is based on the actual reporters that are there. Uh, and I would really like to see a debate where you connect the total defense concept, which is now developing, with also the fact that you need to finance this, this local media out in the country, uh, which is something we haven't seen. It's like it's two different debates that sort of the media crisis is one debate, the psychological defense is another debate in different areas. But these are extremely connected if we want to, to, to uh, uh, survive this discussion. The third reflection I have is that in Sweden we have succeeded not making this a left and right issue. 
I think this is something we need to be extremely care of, take care of. In the US, for example, you see clearly the debate between <coughs> Republicans and Democrats uh, where this is politicized. The Russian influence is already part of the political pr process and the people that gain from this are happy that they gain from this. We have not reached that situation in Sweden. Uh, of course, you have people at the margins that try to use this, like the Nazis or some extreme left groups or, or so. But that's really marginal. And I think that we really need to take care that it's across the aisle. It's all kind of political forces. Um, and we need to cooperate. We need to get all the parties in the parliament on board so, so that, that you really try to get this kind of broad consensus that the Swedish election is in Sweden. It's by the Swedish people's will not by other areas. And I think that's something we need to take really care of. Uh, the third reflection I have is that we only discuss defense. We don't discuss so much the, the offensive capabilities. There is in the, in the uh, Defense Commission's report clearly that we should have def uh, offensive capabilities in terms of cyber, for example. On the other hand, if you look, I see some friends from the Swedish radio here, if you look at Radio Sweden, for example, it could be something that could broadcast to the world what happens in Sweden in English. But most of our language, most of our outlets, most of, of the things that we produce is in Swedish. It's something that no one else would understand in a crisis. And we need to develop also the kind of, of, the kind of offensive capacity to actually reach the world if something happens. Uh, and we need to reach the world not from the government, but from journalists. Because this is the thing, we need to believe in liberal democracy. We need to believe that the journalist is doing the better job of information than the government does. And then you need uh, to establish already when it's not a conflict, you need to establish the institutions that can work in a conflict. I think Radio Sweden could be a good example. Uh, I think there is other good examples like translating newspapers uh, in, different, uh, in, in different languages, etc. We don't have any of that structure in place if something would happen. And it's very obvious to see when you look at the, the Ukraine conflict, for example, that Ukraine didn't really have the capacity to, to inform other countries when it happened. So that is a key. And my last point, what do we see ahead? I think we see a combination of what's happened, as I started with, uh, what happened in the US. We'll see hacking of the parties in Sweden. We'll see hacking of media. We see DDoS attacks on, on, on Swedish media. We see the blinding of the information uh, information space. I think we also will see more of far-right terror. Uh, we have already seen bombs exploding in Gothenburg, people trained in, in Russia to do this from, from the Nordic resistance movement. I think that will happen. I think we need to take sort of height for that happening in the elections. And I also think that if we go down to the kind of basic level, the solution to the, this information is believing in our values. It's believing in independent journalism and in the, the, the believing in the kind of difference of tasks. The government, the authorities should see to the possibility for independent journalists to work. And then we should do our work uh, independent from the state because that's the way we defend uh, those values. Thank you. Um, let's carry on by speaking a little bit about trust. Um, because that is something that we keep returning to, um, the, the trust in our traditional media outlets. Um, in Sweden, the trust in media has always been quite high, but it's probably on decline. And that is probably also one reason why the alternative media outlets are, are growing so rapidly. Um, and those people who, who, who are involved in alternative media or, or gain from it, uh, they don't hesitate to take any chance to, to undermine mainstream media by pointing out any mistake. And you have all, uh, not all, not Patrick, but the two of you have mentioned mistakes that you have done uh, at your newspapers. Uh, you mentioned the fake, uh, fake debate article from the Green Party. Uh, you had a similar case with a fake debate article, but you also mentioned the, the news about uh, Russia defeating ISIS. Um, and I'm sure that there are mistakes uh, done also at Mit Media. Maybe one could, someone remembers what happened what, when you started doing in-house reporting about 
global affairs. Yeah, I went on Swedish radio criticizing my own company for that. <laughs> yeah, um, it was not a success, not a success story. Um, and I mean, you are three. All of all the three of you are experts in the topic, uh, and you agree, I think, uh, that. Uh, uh, knowledge vac uh, vaccinates the people against disinformation, but still this happens in all of the three newspapers that you represent. Uh, what can you do to, to uh, spread this knowledge and, and uh, make sure that you rebuild the trust and credibility for journalism? Looking at me? Uh, I'm looking uh, at all three. Well, I, I, I'll start there because there are two different things here to point out, one thing is internal within journalism to raise awareness, knowledge about these issues. And sorry to say, we have a long way to go. As you stated, we are kind of uh, the exceptions sitting here. But if you go out on our general newsrooms around in Sweden, the knowledge is, is pretty low, I would say. So that's one part. And the other part is, is rebuilding trust in the audience view. And, of course, they are hand-in-hand in, hand in a way, but it's also two different issues. I think uh, the trust is very high on media on general ground. Uh, but, uh, of course, there are also always people who want uh, to, have, uh, to look to sources that confirm their own beliefs. And I don't think that you will ever reach them, actually. And, uh, but you, know, you, you can't know how big that audience is because we know that the troll counts, accounts on Facebook and Twitter is so, so uh, very pumped up. Uh, so, uh, but, but we have a local problem, and maybe we have that in, in every city in Sweden. I don't know, but we have local politicians that uh, have started to take the chance to criticize us for fake news when we report about them in a critical manner. And that's a big, big problem, I think. I, I, think, the, the, I think the problem is very real, and I think that it will be much worse. I, I don't really agree with the idea that this will be better. I think that we are going more into an American situation where different people have trust in different different news. Uh, and the reason for that is political polarization, that we are getting more and more polarized on values. And I mean, you, you, can, you can disagree on a left and right scale, but you can still have kind of a, I would say, a civilized debate. We have not really found that civilized debate on issues like immigration, Islam, um, <laughs> Also, feminism is starting to sort of re-politicize in Sweden uh, from, from the far, far right. Uh, and sort of the debate is extremely tense and extremely angry in a way that makes it hard to be a kind of neutral, have a neutral position. Um, as an editorial writer, it's quite easy for me because I have, I have a, a clear platform. I, I stand for certain values. Everyone knows that. Uh, they can be angry with me, but they can't say I sort of hide my intentions. I think the problem will be more for, for ordinary news reporting, for, for um, the Swedish public radio, the Swedish public television, because they will be accused of not being impartial. From, and that will be the key argument on anything they do. And it's quite, I mean, it, it will be very problematic, I think. So the only solution I have is try to keep the debate alive within the editorial uh, staff uh, and try to really when i mean learn how to know uh, a fake twitter uh, attack from real criticism and i would say that the media the chiefs or the leaders in media is not very good at that at this point you you very often see articles about completely fake stories that that sort of sort of come in, into twitter and then sort of turn into re real news um, so i think that i mean t learn that difference between real public opinion and the kind of organized Twitter attacks, then we have come a, far, a long way. But I think it will be worse before it gets better. And then also to, to start to report about that kind of Twitter attack. Uh, like we had in the, in the, uh, during the Cold War, this information was reported as now is Russia trying to, to fool us with this. Uh, and I, I would like to see more about that as well. Can take it, take a very concrete example. Two years ago, we had this this uh, this probable submarine in the Swedish archipelago, Stockholm Archipelago, 
And in the middle of the submarine, uh, it wasn't a hunt, but the information operation around the submarine or whatever it's called, uh, the submarine hunt, anyway. In the middle of this, uh, all Swedish media reported that the submarine is from Netherlands. On the fact that, uh, on the basis that a Russian source claimed that it was from Netherlands. Of course, that should have been reported. Russia is trying uh, information attack on Sweden. This is disgraceful, Russia should stop. I mean, th that is the debate that we should have had on that. Not the fact that we send out, I mean, we flashed this to all the whole Swedish public. I mean, that Russia's claiming that it's a, a, a Dutch submarine. And we're starting to discuss this as, it, as it's, I mean, as it could have been a, a Dutch submarine. Of course it couldn't. Um, and I think that that kind of reflex to say that, yes, this is a, an information attack and discussed it as an information attack. That could have been a possible, uh, that, that I hope that next time they do that. And that is the problem with speed into journalism. Everyone wants to be first. And there is another uh, example, which is a bad day of journalism, was that when suddenly a lot of uh, trusted media outlets started to report that John Björklund were resigning as party leader for a liberal. And uh, in social media, it was a lot of comments uh, like this was true. And uh, poor John Björklund was a bit uh, confused because he didn't want to resign and had no intention of it. But what was happening, it was a, a error at our parliament's website stating that he had ended his parliamentarian time and a media outlet reported that as he was leaving. Like if it ever would happen that the party leader left with a communication <laughs> on riksdagen.se. That doesn't happen, but still it went out there very, very fast. And, and that's, I, I think that's a really headache that media is not dealing with. I think th that's a great example of, of um, misinformation, but not disinformation. No, I, but uh, that's, uh, yeah. and when you know the weakness, you use it. Exactly. And, and the, the difference between misinformation and disinformation is, of course, the intention. Uh, misinformation is any mistake. Whenever there is a flaw in media, um, that just happened because of speed or, or whatever. Uh, it's misinformation. But to classify something as disinformation, you have to, to, to find a, uh, an intention to be deceptive, um, an, an intention to, to convince someone that something that is false is true. Um, and this is a, a big challenge when we're talking about uh, fact-checking and debunking. Uh, and I guess that you struggled a bit when you were working with, with Granskning Sverige um, with these words. I mean, who is to classify something as disinformation since you more or less have to get inside of the mind of another individual to find that intention? Um, yeah, they, they were actually their counterattack uh, after we published. They... Uh, everywhere there was screaming that we had 45 uh, errors in our investigation. And uh, it was ki quite funny to read those uh, claimed uh, falsehood. Uh, but uh, I think that's... Uh, the, the word fake news, I think it's, uh, it's bad because it's used of, from every side and, uh, and people is misled to believe what that, that actually means. So disinformation is much better, I think. Uh, so, yeah. Let's kill fake news as a term. Yeah. Yeah. Can we decide that now? <laughs> I think that all the panelists today have agreed <laughs> on that. <Yeah. laughs> uh, any other thoughts about the, the challenge to identify and classify something as disinformation? I think the key that we need to be aware of is that there has to be an, an, another actor, an actor from outside. Because we need to make a clear distinction that many of these opinions that, that, that seem to be kind of out in the periphery or very strange is completely acceptable as such. Uh, but it's not acceptable that a foreign actor is trying to impose their will or trying to run the kind of Swedish uh, debate from the outside. And I think that I, I try to say that in my, my opening statement that we have managed to keep this from being a left and right issue. And I think that, that one, of the re, one of the successes in that is that we have tried to say, try to really go through this, try to check the facts, try to see that this is coming from somewhere else, 
this is misinformation, this is disinformation. Um, and I think that that will be very important, that we don't go into a situation where everyone starts accusing each other of being Russian agents uh, in the public debate. If you follow a Twitter, th uh, Twitter feed, you have this Goodwin's law, this, this idea that if, if you follow, follow a debate uh, to a certain extent, someone call the other person Hitler. Today you have the same phenomena in social media, that if the debate goes on and on and on, the possibility that someone call someone else a Russian bot is 100%. Because someone is always a Russian bot in the end, <laughs> uh, which maybe it is, but maybe it's not. So I think that, that try to sort of separate this uh, fake from reality, uh, not fake news then, but this kind of statements from reality, and try to see that we actually know when we call something disinformation, when we debunk lies, we have to be correct. Because the worst thing we can do is having a fact checker that is wrong. Because, I mean, how many fake fact-checkers do you think people survive? One, two, three, then you have no trust in any fact-checkers. So I think this is, this is a key to keep trust. Yeah. And whenever these uh, fact-checking uh, or counter-initiatives are, are founded, there is always plenty of criticism. Um, people talking about... Um, um, like a, a ministry of truth or something like that. And, and the credibility of the actors behind the fact-checking sites are always um, questioned. Um, and I think the, the recent example when, when a few of the biggest media in, in Sweden uh, get together with support from Vinova and, and aim to start a, a, a fact-checking or a debunking initiative is, is uh, quite interesting uh, because it really puts the, the question of trust uh, on its edge. Um, so, most of us probably agree that we need fact-checking and we need debunking, but who should be behind it? Who can be behind it? Uh, and how should we deal with this criticism that always will come? I think that it's a little bit like academia. There is no uh, person or institution that can say 100% that this is the fact. But the fact that you dif different people publish different things uh, the, de the debate is going on, will sort of uh, make the, 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 the truth win in the end. But you need to have the institutions that can combat uh, what is the truth or not. Uh, I, for me, the jury is a little bit out with this initiative by major Swedish media outlets to, to, to cooperate. The jury is a little bit out. It depends on what, how, how this will actually look, uh, because it's a very complicated thing. And to a certain extent, I think that Western civilization is built on competition. Competition in ideas, competition in values, and that the fact that competition will sort of win is something that I believe strongly in when it comes to ideas and, and, and the public debate. So the euro is a little bit out for me uh, if I if sort of believe in this or not. Uh, the challenge here is the amount of disinformation that goes into the debate. And I'm, I'm thinking about your academia parallel here and thinking about uh, climate uh, scientists and we have all got the climate skeptical emails in our email and, and with uh, different uh, links to different scientists stating uh, climate hoax etc 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 so so I, I totally agreed of the very nice thinking of of uh, institution battles about and, and reaching some kind of consensus that we should be aware of that we have distortion into this debate by actors that do not care about what is the consensus in the debate. And, and I think that we need to learn that the truth is not, uh, not in the middle. Because, you know, you've seen this, this, uh, this the newsroom, this, uh, this uh, series, the newsroom with Will McAvoy, that sort of a news anchor in, in uh, I don't remember the channel. But they have, in the, they have at least a debate when, when he says that if, if the Republicans uh, say the Earth is flat, the, Demo the, the Democrats says the Earth is round, uh, the news reports that, that uh, the politicians is not, uh, uh, they, they, they have a fight about the, the size of the Earth, the form of the Earth. And, and th that is very true, I think. Very often we have like, this is one opinion, this is the other opinion, and then we just go like this, and we don't say what's truth. And I think that we need more as journalists to, to sort of put ourselves on the line and say, yes, this is a lie. This is not true. Like the Orland example. Yeah. 
for example. TV4, of course, should have said, no, Gotland have never been neutral. What are you talking about? Are you confusing it with Åland? I mean, just that question would have destroyed the whole concept from, from Victor Kremenjuk. So, so we need, as journalists, to sort of take a stance in the science. Then sometimes we will be wrong. And then people will be angry with us. But that's sort of part of the job. And, and uh, here also to, to, to just make a statement against uh, SVT with their debate format. It's really problematic when you have this polarized debate as a format, television format, and you bring uh, doctors knowing vaccine together with moms skeptical of vaccines. The, the, that's a way of making public television that you shouldn't do. I was actually part of that kind of false false balance uh, that uh, both uh, Swedish television and Swedish uh, radio is is uh, in a uh, kind of problematic uh, stand right now. I was in Almedalen uh, this uh, summer and uh, last summer and I was uh, asked to to talk about our investigation uh, at uh, Sveriges Radio uh, for only about 10 minutes and uh, when I came there 20 minutes before it was going to be aired they said uh, Gransin Sverige is coming here they they want to debate with you and they uh, let a troll factory uh, person to uh, to debate with me about an, an, an investigation that we have done and uh, of course I knew that I could never win that discussion I could never, if I would have to, got into to discussion with a troll, I would never win. So it was kind of uh, problematic and uh, I told them afterwards and they couldn't really um, understand the problem because uh, public service have to be uh, objective and uh, shouldn't take stand and they have to come, uh, they have to be able to, to tell that, us what they think about our investigation and so on. So uh, this is a really, really big problem for public service, I think. To have influence by postmodern journalism. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but the key usually, I mean, the key is to be impartial when it comes to values. That's something we can debate, two of us and not impartial when it comes to facts. And to reach that, it sounds easy, but to reach that, is, it's not that easy. I, I don't know if you, you noticed a couple of weeks ago, there was a debate in Agenda between Strandhell, uh, who is the minister, social affairs minister, and uh, Jimmy Åkesson, who is the party leader of, of, uh, of the Sweden Democrats, who disagreed on their proposal of how much money the Sweden Democrats were putting into healthcare. And that is not very easy for a journalist in the studio to say that he's wrong and she's right. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that's that kind of debate, probably in the future, if we want to be impartial when it comes to facts, actually need an expert in the studio who say that, yes, he's claiming this, but in the budget, this is the facts. Uh, of course, that expert will be attacked as impartial. So <laughs> it will be tough, but I think that we need to step up this, this kind of referee part. Uh, Journalists need to be on the field playing the game, not refereeing it. Yes. Yeah. We talked a lot about the quality of, of journalism and, and uh, how you and your colleagues work and should work. Uh, but at the other, other end, we have the readers and the viewers. Um, and a, a study from Columbia University has shown that 59% of all articles in social media are being shared without first being read. Uh, I guess that was made in an American context. Um, but statistics that I access from a media project that I work with shows that it's probably quite similar um, in Sweden. Uh, we like and we share things before we read them or without reading them. Um, and Elizabeth Bauer pointed out in her opening uh, opening remarks that people take part in the information war without knowing it, uh, by spreading narratives, liking and sharing fake or heavily biased news without knowing that they are actually doing that. Um, and it seems like people don't only have a hard time to know who to trust, they simply don't care. What can we do to tackle that? 
media literacy or källkritik in Swedish is one, of, is one of those popular words that we like to talk about. But how can we make people actually read things and review things before they share them? I think the knowledge of uh, fact-checking and uh, shell critique uh, is, uh, is uh, quite good at the younger uh, people in our community, but it's uh, much worse when you get up in age. And we know that Facebook is not for the younger persons. It's uh, people like us in this room. So uh, I think we have to learn people uh, how to be more fact-checking, how to do this, how to search on images and try to get to the source and so on. Uh, but the, there is an example on Facebook. Uh, there was someone who was writing a, a column about uh, just fact-checking and, and when you're uh, sharing uh, links, and it was about... Uh, Something like, uh, if you, uh, you're smarter if you don't read books, it was the headline, and people were sharing that. But in the, the column, it was quite the opposite. And uh, people were sharing it, and yeah, 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 I I'm, I'm don't read books, I'm smart. So uh, it's kind, kind of interesting how people act. I think it's a little bit of a hopeless thing, to be honest, uh, for our generation. I think the young generation that grow up with Facebook sort of learn this in school and learn this by, by default. Uh, I think there is a quite big problem with Facebook and with these uh, giants. Uh, and, and we need, there is the saying that we need to embed some kind of ethic in the code, in the algorithms that, that Facebook is using. If you look at Facebook in the American election, it was quite obvious that it was a rage machine. It sort of fed on rage. Uh, regardless on, on what kind of issues come up, uh, it was, uh, and regardless of the Russian influence, it was a kind of Facebook were driving the polarization very much. And I think that this is also an experience that we need to talk with Facebook and Twitter and social media about. In the same way we have a media ethic as publishers or, or as, as editorial writers or as journalists in the media, there need to be some kind of ethics with these giants, uh, what they publish. And now that ethic is basically they don't public porn or they don't publish uh, sort of extremely brutal pictures. It also needs to be encoded in that system not to have rage as the key factor. Um, and I think that, that in Germany, for example, they have started this debate now with, with Facebook. Uh, and and I, of course it's possible. Everyone says that, no, this is not possible to have this debate with these, uh, with these giants. But I mean... They are basically uh, running on different tax exemptions in different countries. They're basically publishers, these organizations. And of course, as publishers, they have a responsibility. So w if we talk to them about their responsibility, of course that will be something that we can reach an agreement on. If we do it as the European Union, maybe not if we do it as Sweden, <laughs> because we're quite small in the face of Facebook, but in the European Union we can do that. And I think Germany shows that this is possible. But Will this solve the problem? No, it won't. This is a new media landscape. We can sort of solve some of the problems, but we need to adapt to the fact that it's new. Our children have already adapted. Uh, so we are the problem in that sense. Yeah. Uh, time flies. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, do you want to give short comments on this before we uh, let in the audience? Uh, just, uh, I've heard that the angry emo in Facebook get more reach than the thumb up. Hmm. So, it's kind of, rage is a s strong feeling. And what I was going to say would open up another issue, so I think we'll let in the audience. Yeah, uh, I think we have a first question from Gunnar Högmark. First, um, Anders, you, you underline one thing that I think is extremely important. That this, this has not been a left-right issue in the Swedish debate. We see the conflicts in democracy, but we are unified on democracy. And how do you think we best can safeguard this? Because this is a very extremely important thing. Second, and that is that I think the, the work of the Eskilstuna Korean regarding uh, the troll factory and, and what Jessica Aro told us earlier about the, the troll factory in St. Petersburg is telling us something that 
and that is that the disclosure of these obscure activities have a very high political cost, and there is a big loss of prestige as well. How do we do in order to increase these costs and aim more for these disclosures? Because I'm, I'm sometimes surprised about, uh, and Anders touched upon that as well, how, how little we are doing that. We are now discussing more how are we to see that media is not subject for influence operations, but we could just as well, and we should discuss it the other way around. Third question, and that is what I think is the search for the holy grail, that the truth. I mean, the credibility of free media is not this certain different single media. It is the freedom of the media, the competition. Uh, I, in, in some way, uh, I have high belief in most media, uh, in Aftonbladet as well as in Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, I'm more hesitant to the editorial side, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Just want for the sake. <laughs> But I think we survived that. Yes, yes, exactly. We, we are mutual on that. Uh, uh, but the important thing is the, f the idea. You're not uh, just being recorded. Yes, the idea and the point with free media is that you are competing. But the interesting thing is that media sometimes, especially in these areas, are in some way acting the other way around when you are criticized or, or uh, under under fire, are unifying and acting as an homogeneous. Extra, and that is undermining credibility, and that's why I'm a little bit. Uh, I think uh, the jury is still out for this cooperation between big media's. I rather would like the media to be criticizing each other, having uh, critical research, scrutinizing what is said, instead of as we saw in some of the examples of, of Patrick, that one news here becomes the truth for everyone. So how do we achieve a real? competitive media using the value of being free? Maybe I should start with the first question. Uh, I think that how do, how do we solve a situation now when, when, when we are sort of, when we see all these problems, uh, we know that, that this is very much up to ordinary people, to everyone to understand their role in this. I think one of the keys is how Swedish democracy is built. Swedish democracy is built on the big, big public organizations. It's the trade unions, it's the employers' organizations, it's the farmers' organizations, it's the free church, it's the Church of Sweden. It's all these kind of enormous organizations with lots of people. That is what built democracy 100 years ago. You know, this year is 100 years ago the, the decisions of having real democracy in Sweden or, or having parliamentary democracy with one single person, one vote uh, was taken. Of course, that was built on these kind of public support from the many people, uh, to use something that sounds kind of leftish. Uh, I think that's still the solution. We need to use this organi organized society. We need to, to, to sort of partner with civil society. We need to get all these people to understand that democracy is under threat, and it's their responsibility to be part of the solution. Uh, I think that that is also extremely powerful. Because once you have started to educate people all over the country, uh, you will not be susceptible to these kind of information warfare. Because when people know, uh, when people have this kind of pre-understanding of what could happen in the elections, of course you raise the bar for an attacker, and you also make an attacker less effective. Um, if something happens, like in the US, that, that, that some of the parties are attacked or so, if that's not the main debate, if the public debate continues to go on anyway, of course that will have less effect. We saw that in France, for example. Uh, so it's, it's possible to, to do that. So I think the key is this kind of people, movements, democracy. Um, but we have a long way to, to sort of reach a situation where people are educated. I think that uh, question was to me. Uh, the other one was... Yeah. Can I, I Come. Which one would you like to grab? <laughs> I can comment. Uh, this is yes. Um, uh, the the you said it very well. I think uh, when you told us uh, that in two two or three years we don't have local media in Sweden. Uh, I don't know if you people are, are aware of the price uh, the price uh, that we're paying now because we have to develop their digital uh, channels. At, uh, at the same time, we have to carry out the papers to our uh, customers. 
Uh, Aftonbladet don't have that problem, not uh, DN or uh, Expressen either, because you don't have uh, the, the people is far out on the countryside. We have promised them a paper before six o'clock and the cost is uh, totally going through the roof now. So uh, uh, me and uh, Patrick is maybe out of work in a couple of years, and that's a big, big problem for, for d democracy. And I can just answer the, your other question about what to do about the harassments and threats to the journalists. And I think uh, politicians have to, to look at the legislation because there's uh, not much to do for the police uh, at the moment uh, to investigate those kind of threats. Uh, because it's an anonymous uh, account and uh, the social media platform is it's not so uh, willingly to, to let the, the, uh, the information uh, to the police. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, the th and the police have to, to take it seriously because we have, uh, we have uh, been um, uh, reporting a lot of really, really serious uh, things, but they have uh, put down every investigation uh, and we know who it is. We have the recordings, we have eyewitness. Uh, it doesn't matter. And I think you stressed there one part thing that to get brave journalism into investigating these things is, is to have the, the ordinary civil society, the, the legal system and so on, protective net, because to do things like, like you did comes with a very high price. And you should be aware of that, and, and society needs to, to handle mm. that price. Um, and you pointed out the economical factors. And um, coming to your third question, uh, Mr. Hökmark, one of the biggest problems I had when I was leading in the newsroom was to get my colleagues doing negative reporting about a competitor. Uh, so that is a very instinct that, that reporters do not... I think it's better today than it was but they were afraid that they would get hit back. And we need to, to leave that kind of mentality to view ourselves and other media outlets as ordinary companies with powers that, of course, should be scrutinized, should be, be looked into and questioned. Uh, and that is a responsibility that, that we have. And I think it's really good that we have this public service initiative um, in Swedish radio, Mediana. Uh, that feels a good role in that, but we need more of that. Do we have any last question? Hi, uh, Carl Åkerström, Association of Foreign Affairs, Stockholm. Uh, first of all, uh, I kind of have to burst your bubble on that the younger people are better at recognizing fake news than uh, older people, as uh, Peter um said earlier about European defense against fake news, uh, it's worse than you think. Because uh, uh, the education in Swedish schools basically don't use Wikipedia as a source, and after that, go do whatever you want. Basically, we're not taught how to recognize fake news. And uh, I was wondering how you, not only young people, but also the public in general, how what you would suggest to educate them on how to recognize it. Yeah. Uh, I, I take that first. Uh, I would like to see a system where, where quality news is marked as quality news with an independent quality uh, board like in every other aspect that you have in, in society when you need to deal with, with, uh, with quality, like in the medical industry and so on, to look at processes and how you mark things and so on. It's not about content, it's about methods. And, and that should be, be one piece of solution uh, for the future. A I few think... words about Wikipedia before you carry on. Because I, yeah. I'm taking the role of a panelist now for a minute or two. Um, I, I think that Wikipedia is a media that we should discuss much more than we do, since it's so widespread how we use Wikipedia. And it's so well documented how different states use Wikipedia as an influence tool. And if you look at the, most, uh, the 50 most active uh, Wikipedia users in Sweden, you will find that somewhere around 40 or something on that list, uh, you have one of the most active 
pro-Russian trolls with ties to the Russian embassy. Uh, and he posted, uh, I think it was 3,500 3, edits or something in one year only about Russian history. Um, and you will find not only Russian interests, but so many different state and non-state actors trying to influence what's out there on Wikipedia. And that is what kids actually use in schools as a main source, but also you will find plenty of fact boxes in, in newspapers with Wikipedia as its source. And it's a, it's a target of influence operations. Sorry. <laughs> I think we could be more transparent about how we do our investigation. Uh, we can uh, put the sources out there, if you, of course, not anonymous. Uh, uh, and we can uh, be better to write about how to be more accurate and, and fact check uh, things. Uh, we published a, a paper about our investigation with the laws. Uh, uh, and what the press ethics says and s stuff like that, and with a, a school, how to be more fact-checking. And we spread that to every person in Hall, uh, Sörmland. So uh, I think the papers can do more uh, in teaching schools and uh, be able to put the... We, can, we uh, provide them with this kind of material, so I think we can take a stand there. No, I agree completely. Hmm? <laughs> um, it's a good last question because it gives us a little hope, perhaps, that the cooperation between, uh, between uh, newspapers and schools will bring us a, uh, a wise young generation who will have the right tools to tackle these, these issues the coming years. Um, thank you so much for participating in this panel. Um, a small gift from Stockholm Free World Forum and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, and I will leave the floor to Katarina Tratch for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. So thank you very much to our last panel. And I just wanted to seize this opportunity before...